Hi everyone, it's Professor Pemberton, and today we're going to talk about rational functions. So in this section, we're going to talk about how to determine the domain of a rational function, and we're also going to describe the transformations used to graph the rational function from the basic functions y equals 1 over x, or y equals 1 divided by x squared. So let's start off by talking about what is a rational function. A rational function is a function of this form. We'll call it lowercase r of x because it's a rational function, but a rational function is just a quotient of two polynomial functions. So your numerator, p of x, will be a polynomial function, and the denominator, q of x, is also a polynomial function. And we're also going to assume that p of x and q of x have no common factors. In other words, you factor the polynomial p of x and you factor the polynomial q of x, and you've already simplified the function completely by canceling out or simplifying any common factors. The only restriction is that q of x, the denominator, it cannot be zero. So even though rational functions are constructed by polynomial functions in the numerator and denominator, their graphs will actually look quite different from the graphs of polynomial functions. So let's talk about rational functions and their asymptotes. So recall that the domain of a rational function is the set of all real numbers except for the x values that will make the denominator, in this case, the denominator q of x, the polynomial function, where is the polynomial function in the denominator equal to zero? And we'll have to rule out those x values or exclude those x values from the domain of the entire function r of x. So since the graphs of rational functions are different than polynomial functions, we're going to pay very special attention to the behavior of the graph near the x values that will make the denominator equal to zero. So let's look at example one. We're going to review how to find the domain of a rational function. So find the domain for each of the following rational functions and express your answer using interval notation. So number one, the function is f of x equals 3x squared divided by the quantity x squared subtract 9. And so notice that this is a rational function because 3x squared is a polynomial function and x squared subtract 9 is also a polynomial function. So you have a division of two polynomial functions and that's what's called a rational function. Well, we're not worried about where the numerator is equal to zero. We're worried about where the denominator is equal to zero because we cannot divide by zero and have an output value. So the domain of f of x, if you take x squared minus nine and it cannot be equal to zero and you factor that polynomial function, you have two numbers that need to multiply to negative nine and the same two numbers need to add to zero because this has zero x. Well, the two numbers at work are positive three and negative three. So it's x plus three times x subtract three. And so that cannot be equal to zero when you multiply those two factors together. That means x plus three cannot be zero and x subtract three cannot be zero. That means x cannot be negative three and x cannot be three. And so the domain for this rational function will be the set of all real numbers except for x equals negative three and x equals three. Or using interval notation, it would be parentheses negative infinity to negative three, union negative three to three, union three to infinity. And they all use parentheses because infinity and negative infinity are not real numbers and negative three and three are also being excluded from the domain. Let's try one more, number two. This time the function is g of x is equal to x subtract five is the numerator, and the quantity and the denominator is x squared minus four x subtract five. Notice if you factor the denominator, x squared subtract four x minus five will actually factor as x subtract five times x plus one factors. So the x minus five is actually in common in both the numerator and denominator. So although x minus five is a common factor in both the numerator and denominator, the domain of the function is where the denominator cannot be equal to zero. So this is the entire function originally. We need to find out where is the denominator, x squared minus four x minus five, where is that not equal to zero? And so if you factor the denominator, you get x subtract five times x plus one because it's two numbers that multiply to negative five and the same two numbers need to add to negative four and then negative five and positive one work. So x minus five times x plus one cannot be zero. So that means x minus five cannot be zero and x plus one cannot be zero. So x cannot be positive five and x cannot be negative one. So it's the set of all real numbers for the domain except for x equals negative one and x equals five. Both of those values must be excluded from the domain of this function g of x. And so the domain of this rational function g of x using interval notation would be negative infinity to negative one, union, negative one to five, union, five to infinity. And notice again, you only use parentheses because infinity and negative infinity are not real numbers and negative one and five are excluded from the domain of the function g of x. So now that we know how to find the domain of a rational function, we're actually going to start looking at what's happening to the graph whenever you get close to these x values that make the denominator equal to zero. So whenever you're graphing rational functions, it's very important to remember the graph of the basic rational function, f of x equals one divided by x or y equals one divided by x. And also determine the behavior near the x values for which the denominator, in this case, the value that makes the denominator equal to zero is x equals zero. So we're gonna find out what happens to the graph whenever we get close to x equals zero from either the left side of x equals zero or on the right side of x equals zero. So we're gonna make two different tables of values. The table on the left is whenever you're approaching x equals zero from the left side, and the table on the right is whenever you're approaching x equals zero from the right. And so we're gonna choose x values that get close to x equals zero from the left side. 
So let's choose these x values, negative 0 0.1, negative 0 0.01, and negative 0 0.00001. If you substitute these values into the function f of x equals 1 divided by x, the y values are, if you plug in negative 0.1, you'll get negative 10. Negative 0 0.01, you'll get negative 100 for the y value. And negative 0 0.00001, you'll get negative 100,000. Notice what happens to these y values. Whenever the x values are getting really, really close to x equals 0, the y values are decreasing without bound. It looks like the y values will continue to get larger and larger negative numbers whenever we get closer and closer to x equals 0 from the left side. So there's a way to summarize this using arrow notation. If x is approaching x equals 0 from the left side, the arrow notation to denote that is so x and then right arrow and then a 0 and then the superscript is a minus sign. The minus sign means you're approaching from the left side. It doesn't mean you're approaching from the negative numbers. It's, it means that you're approaching from the left side of x equals 0. And the y values look like they're decreasing without bound. So the way to write that using arrow notation, the y values are decreasing without bound means y is right arrow negative infinity. The y values are decreasing without bound and the y values are getting larger and larger negative numbers. Now on the other hand, let's look at what happens on the right side of x equals zero. If you plug in values that are getting closer to x equals zero from the right side, let's plug in x equals 0 0.1, 0 0.01, and 0 0.00001. If these x values are plugged into the function f of x equals one divided by x, the y values will be 10 whenever you plug in 0 0.1. It'll be 100 y value when you plug in x equals 0 0.01, Whenever x equals 0.00001, the y value is a positive 100,000. So again, let's summarize what we just found out by just looking at the table of values. If you're getting closer to x equals 0 from the right side, you're making the x values get smaller, but they're all positive values this time. So if x is approaching x equals 0 from the right side, the arrow notation to denote that would be x right arrow 0 with a superscript of a plus. The plus means that you're approaching from the right side, not necessarily the positive numbers. And notice what happens to the y values. The output values look like they're increasing without bound this time. So the y values are increasing without bound or y right arrow infinity using arrow notation. So what we just found out is that if x approaching zero from the left side, the function y equals one divided by x is decreasing without bound. And if x is approaching zero from the right side, the y values one divided by x are increasing without bound. So that's what's happening whenever you're getting close to x equals zero, and we found out x equals zero because that's what makes the denominator equal to zero. So on one end, the graph is decreasing without bound on the left side of x equals zero, but on the right side of x equals zero, the graph was increasing without bound. Now, in addition, we're also going to be interested in determining the end behavior of rational function graphs. So if we want to talk about the end behavior of rational functions, we're going to see what happens to the graph of the rational function y equals one over x, the basic rational function again, as the x values and absolute value become large without bound. So what happens whenever x approaches infinity or whenever x approaches negative infinity? That's what we're gonna be interested in for the end behavior. So again, let's make two different tables of values for the graph, f of x equals one divided by x. So let's make the x values decrease without bound first. So we're gonna plug in negative 10 for the x values, negative 100 and negative 100,000. Now notice what happens with the y values. If you substitute negative 10 into the function y equals one over x, you'll have one divided by negative 10, that's negative one tenth or negative 0.1. If you plug in x equals negative 100 into the function, you'll find out that the y value is negative 0 0.01 or negative one hundredth. And if the x value is negative 100,000, f of x, the y value will be negative 0 0.00001. So let's describe the behavior of the graph using error notation. Whenever the x values are decreasing without bound, so as x decreases without bound, that means x right arrow negative infinity, it looks like the y values or the output values are getting really close to zero. So the y values are approaching y equals zero and that means y right arrow zero. Now on the other hand, let's make x increase without bound. So the other table shows if we plug in x equals 10, x equals 100 or x equals 100,000, the output values are 0 0.1 when you substitute in x equals 10, 0 0.01 whenever you plug in x equals 100 and 0 0.00001 whenever x is equal to 100,000. So it looks like if x is increasing without bound, so that means x right arrow infinity, it looks like, again, the y values are getting really, really small. They're getting closer and closer to y equals zero. And so the y values approach zero, or using arrow notation, it would be y right arrow zero. So these last two tables show that if the absolute value of x becomes large without bound, so that means x approaches infinity or x approaches negative infinity, x either increases without bound or x decreases without bound, the value of the function f of x equals one over x or y equals one over x 
gets closer and closer to the x-axis or the closer and closer to y equals zero. So using this information from the last four tables that we've talked about, the end behavior for these last two tables, and also the first two tables whenever we were approaching x equals zero, and if we plot a few additional points, we can actually find the graph of the rational function f of x equals one over x, or y equals one divided by x. So let's talk about what happens whenever you get close to x equals zero first. So on the left side of x equals zero, we found that the graph was decreasing without bound. So that means as we get closer and closer to x equals zero, the y values were becoming more and more negative. So the y values were decreasing without bound. They'll continue to get larger and larger, but negative numbers. So it looks like the graph will get closer and closer to the y-axis, but never actually touch it. On the other hand, if you're approaching x equals zero from the right side of the y-axis, then the graph was increasing without bound. The y values were increasing towards positive infinity. So it looks like if you're getting closer and closer to x equals zero from the right side of x equals zero, then the graph is going up towards positive infinity. So this actually has a name. If the y values are decreasing without bound, or if the y values are increasing without bounds on either side of a vertical line, that vertical line is called a vertical asymptote. And so the vertical asymptote for this graph, y equals one divided by x, the y-axis or x equals zero is called a vertical asymptote. On the other hand, if you wanna talk about the end behavior of the graph of the rational function, y equals one divided by x, we're looking at what happens whenever x increases without bounds or x decreases without bound. Let's look at what happens whenever x increases without bound first. If the x values are getting very, very large, the y values were approaching zero or the x-axis. So if you go to the right forever, the end behavior of the graph is that the y values will get closer and closer to the x-axis or y equals zero. And so the graph will have this shape in the first quadrant. The graph will go up towards positive infinity if you get closer and closer to x equals zero. But on the other hand, if x increases without bound as you go to the right, the y values get close to zero or y equals zero. Now on the other end of the graph, the end behavior was if x approaches negative infinity, the y values were also getting closer and closer to zero. So we know the graph was decreasing without bound if we get closer and closer to x equals zero, but if we go to the left forever, the graph is getting closer and closer to y equals zero. So if x goes towards negative infinity, the y values were getting closer and closer to the x-axis. And so the graph will be this shape in quadrant three. The graph will go down as you get closer and closer to x equals zero from the left, but the graph will get closer and closer to the x-axis whenever x approaches negative infinity. And so again, it looks like you're getting closer to the x-axis, but you're never actually touching the x-axis on the ends of the graph. So that is what's called a horizontal asymptote because it's a horizontal line this time. So the x-axis or y equals zero is called a horizontal asymptote for the graph of f of x equals one divided by x. And remember the domain of this rational function, f of x is equal to one divided by x, the domain were the set of all real numbers except for x equals zero. Because we don't get an output value whenever x equals zero is substituted into the function, you have one divided by zero, which is undefined. So the domain using interval notation would be negative infinity to zero, union zero to infinity, all with parentheses. So this is a very important graph to remember. The graph of this function, f of x is equal to one divided by x, is in quadrants one and three, and the graph will have a vertical asymptote at the y-axis, x equals zero, and you'll have a horizontal asymptote, which is the x-axis or y equals zero. So in the basic rational function, f of x is equal to one divided by x, we notice that the vertical line x equals zero is called a vertical asymptote of the graph, and the horizontal line y equals zero, which is the x-axis, is called a horizontal asymptote. So let's talk a little bit more in detail about the horizontal and vertical asymptotes, because we will not always have the vertical asymptote be the y-axis, and the horizontal asymptote will not always be the x-axis. So the definition of vertical and horizontal asymptotes, the line x equals a is a vertical asymptote of the function y equals f of x. If the y values approach either positive infinity or negative infinity, if x approaches x equals a from the right side or the left side of x equals a. So notice what happens whenever you're approaching x equals a from the right side. So if you're approaching x equals a from the right side, it'll be x right arrow a with a little plus as a superscript. The y values are increasing without bound. That means that the graph will increase towards positive infinity. And so x equals a, this dashed line, it's not actually part of the graph. It's what's called a vertical asymptote. And on the other hand, if you're approaching x equals a from the left side, it'll be x right arrow a with a little subtraction sign or minus sign as a superscript. The y values are increasing without bound. So y right arrow infinity means that the graph will increase without bound or tend towards positive infinity. In either of these cases, the line x equals a is called a vertical asymptote and is denoted as a dashed line when we graph rational functions.
Now, if the graph is decreased without bounds on the left side of x equals a, or decreasing without bound as x approaches a from the right side, you'll have these last two graphs. So if x is approaching a from the right side, x right arrow a with a little plus, the y values decrease without bound, then the graph, as x gets closer and closer to x equals a, which is this dashed line, x equals a, the y values decrease without bound, so y tends towards negative infinity. And the last case, if x is approaching x equals a from the left side, x right arrow a with a little subtraction sign or minus sign, the y values decrease without bound mean the graph will go down towards negative infinity on the left side of the vertical asymptote x equals a. And again, this vertical line, x equals a, is what's called a vertical asymptote. It's a dashed line. It's not actually part of the rational function's graph. And now, on the other hand, if you have horizontal asymptote, a line y equals b is a horizontal asymptote of a function of y equals f of x. If the y values approach y equals b as either x approaches positive infinity or x approaches negative infinity. So this is what happens on the ends of the graph, the right end of the graph as x approaches positive infinity, or the left end of the graph if x approaches negative infinity. If the y values approach y equals b, then y equals b is called a horizontal asymptote of the function y equals f of x. So if you're talking about the end behavior, the right end behavior of the graph, if the y values approach b as x approaches positive infinity, then the graph will get closer and closer to this horizontal line y equals b, and so y equals b is called a horizontal asymptote. Or if you're talking about the left end of the behavior of the graph, then x approaches negative infinity. If the y values approach y equals b, then the y equals b is called a horizontal asymptote. And so it looks like the graph will get closer and closer to this horizontal line y equals b, and so that's what's called a horizontal asymptote. Now there is one key difference between vertical asymptotes and horizontal asymptotes. For vertical asymptotes, the graph will never touch or cross a vertical asymptote. It will actually get closer and closer to a vertical asymptote, but never actually cross or touch it. The y values will either increase or decrease without bounds. On the other hand, for a horizontal asymptote, the graph may intersect or cross a horizontal asymptote. So notice in this graph, you actually have an intersection point between the graph, y equals f of x, and your horizontal asymptote, y equals b. The definition of a horizontal asymptote was the end behavior of the graph. If the y values are approaching y equals b as x approaches the positive infinity or x approaches negative infinity, the graph may actually cross or touch a horizontal asymptote in the interior of the graph, not the end behavior. So as we're going to see, identifying the vertical and horizontal asymptotes of a rational function are going to have significant roles in determining the behavior of the graph, near vertical asymptotes and also its end behavior. So notice in the above definition of vertical and horizontal asymptotes, we use error notation. This notation is a shorthand way of describing the behavior of the graph when you approach a vertical asymptote on the left side of the vertical asymptote or the right side of the vertical asymptote, and also the end behavior of the graph as x approaches positive infinity or x approaches negative infinity. So if x right arrow a with a little minus sign, that means x is approaching x equals a from the left side. x right arrow a with a little plus means x approaching x equals a from the right side. Okay, again, the minus sign and the plus sign don't have anything to do with negative numbers or positive numbers. The negative means you're approaching from the left. The plus means you're approaching x equals a from the right. If x right arrow negative infinity, that means x goes towards negative infinity, or the x values are decreasing without bound. And if x right arrow infinity, that means the right end of the graph, that is when x approaches positive infinity, or x increases without bound. These last two are talking about the end behavior. That's about horizontal asymptotes. Do the y values approach a particular value on the right end of the graph or the left end of the graph? And that's for horizontal asymptotes. Whereas the first two are talking about what happens on either side of the vertical asymptote, x equals a. So let's finish up this video by talking about transformations of the basic rational function. A rational function of the form r of x is equal to ax plus b in the numerator and cx plus d in the denominator. So you have a linear function in the numerator and a linear function in the denominator. If you take these two linear functions and divide, you get what's called a rational function. You can actually graph this rational function by either shifting, stretching, or reflecting the graph of the basic function y equals 1 divided by x by using transformations. So we're going to review transformations of graphs to actually graph this rational function, lowercase r of x, ax plus b in the numerator and cx plus d in the denominator. So in the next example, we're going to use polynomial long division to rewrite the rational function into an equivalent form that I can identify the quotient and the remainder polynomials. And that way we can actually identify the transformations more easily. So example two, using transformations to graph rational functions. Graph each of the following rational functions using transformations of the basic function y equals 1 divided by x. So we're going to try to relate the rational function that we're given to y equals 1 over x so we can identify the transformations. State the domain and range of the rational function that's given and also identify any vertical or horizontal asymptotes.
So number one, we're going to look at the rational function f of x is equal to 2 divided by x subtract 3. So notice that 2 is a polynomial function, and also x minus 3 is a polynomial function. So if you take these two and divide, you get a rational function. Let's rewrite this function so we can identify the transformations and how it relates to y equals 1 over x. So notice that you have a 2 in the numerator. You can just take 2 times 1 divided by x minus 3, and that's the same function. It's really 2 times 1 in the numerator, and you have x minus 3 in the denominator. And so now notice, it looks like you have a 2 times another fraction, or times another rational function. The rational function has x subtract 3 in the denominator and 1 in the numerator. So it looks like we can compare this to y equals 1 over x now. Starting with the graph of y equals 1 over x, the transformations to graph this function f of x, which is 2 divided by x minus 3 in the denominator, looks like the 2 is a vertical stretch by a factor of 2, because you're taking the entire 1 over x minus 3 and you're multiplying by 2, so that's going to multiply the y values by 2. And it looks like you have x minus 3 in the denominator instead of x in the denominator, like y equals 1 over x. And so that is a horizontal shift right 3 units. So let's start off by finding out the domain of this rational function f of x, because that's going to identify where are the vertical asymptotes for this graph of f of x. The denominator cannot be equal to 0, so that means x minus 3 cannot be equal to 0, or x cannot be equal to 3. So the domain of f of x is negative infinity to 3 and 3 to infinity, all with parentheses. And now the range of f of x we're going to find out after we graph the function f of x. So we'll start off by graphing y equals 1 divided by x. So remember, 1 divided by x will be in quadrants 1 and quadrant 3. The graph will pass through the point 1 comma 1, negative 1 comma negative 1, and also negative 1 half comma negative 2, and also 1 half comma positive 2. The graph of y equals 1 divided by x has a vertical asymptote, which is the y-axis, and it has a horizontal asymptote, which is the x-axis. Now let's see what happens to the asymptotes whenever we have transformations of the graph, where it's a vertical stretch by a factor of 2, and a horizontal shift right 3 units. So let's talk about the vertical asymptote. The vertical asymptote was x equals 0. If you shift the entire graph right 3 units, the vertical asymptote will also be shifted right 3 units. So now the vertical asymptote will now be x equals 3. So notice that the dashed line is now x equals 3 for the vertical asymptote. And since we're shifting the graph right 3 units, the horizontal asymptote will not change. It's just shifted to the right 3 units. It's not going to affect it. It's still going to be y equals 0. And now let's talk about the vertical stretch by a factor of 2. We know that vertical stretch, or vertical shrink, actually only affects the y values. And so if you're talking about the y values, let's look at the horizontal asymptote. If the horizontal asymptote is y equals 0, and the y values are multiplied by 2 because it's a vertical stretch, well, if you take y equals 0 and you multiply by 2, it's still y equals 0. So the horizontal asymptote is still y equals 0. And the vertical asymptote was x equals 3. If you take the y values and multiply by 2, it's not going to affect the vertical asymptote. It's still going to be x equals 3. So now let's graph the function f of x, now that we know where the horizontal and the vertical asymptotes are. The vertical asymptote is at x equals 3, and the horizontal asymptote is y equals 0, and so it's going to look like this shape. It's going to be a graph that's going to be in the right corner of the vertical and horizontal asymptotes, and it's also going to be in the bottom left corner formed from your horizontal and vertical asymptotes. So it looks like the graph will go like this, in, in the bottom left corner. And so that's the graph of f of x equals 2 divided by x minus 3 using transformations obtained from the graph of y equals 1 divided by x. So in the last problem, we didn't have to use polynomial division. It was already in the form that we could actually relate the function back to y equals 1 divided by x. However, in number 2, the function is g of x is equal to 3x plus 5 in the numerator divided by x plus 2. We need to rewrite this function so we can actually identify how is it related to y equals 1 divided by x. So let's do polynomial division first to find out what is the quotient and the remainder polynomials. So remember how this works. You have 3x plus 5 will go on the inside. That's the dividend polynomial. And the x plus 2 will go on the outside because that's the divisor polynomial. Now you want to find out how many times does the first term of the divisor go into the, the first term of your dividend polynomial. And you'll find out that it's 3. So if you take 3 times x, you'll get 3x. And 3 times 2 will give you 6. Now subtract the entire answer. So you'll have 3x minus 3x, that's 0. And then you'll have 5 minus 6, that's negative 1. So 3 is the quotient polynomial, and negative 1 is the remainder polynomial. So you can rewrite g of x using the division algorithm as 3x plus 5 divided by x plus 2 is equal to quotient 3, and then the remainder is negative 1, so minus 1, divided by what you were dividing by, x plus 2, the divisor polynomial. And so it's negative 1 over x plus 2 plus 3. So now let's relate this graph of g of x back to the graph of y equals 1 divided by x, the basic rational function.
it looks like if you start with the graph of y equals 1 divided by x, the transformations to get this graph of g of x is a reflection about the x-axis because it's not just 1 divided by x plus 2. There's a negative sign out in front, so that's going to affect all the y values. It's going to change the sign of your y values to be the opposite sign, so that's a reflection across the x-axis. You also have plus 3. That's going to shift the graph up 3, so that's a vertical shift up 3 units. And notice it's not just x in the denominator like y equals 1 over x is. It's x plus 2 in the denominator for g of x. So that looks like you replaced x with an x plus 2. That's a horizontal shift left 2 units. So let's talk about the domain of g of x next. Notice that x plus 2 was the denominator of g of x. x plus 2 cannot be equal to 0, so x cannot be equal to negative 2. And so the domain of g of x is negative infinity to negative 2, union negative 2 to positive infinity, all with parentheses. So now let's talk about what happens to your vertical and horizontal asymptotes if you have these transformations for g of x. So remember the graph of y equals 1 over x. That's this graph. You have a graph that will pass through 1 comma 1, and it'll be in the top right corner, so quadrant 1. You'll have a vertical asymptote at x equals 0, and you have a horizontal asymptote at y equals 0. And the graph will also be in quadrant 3, and it'll pass through negative 1, negative 1. Let's see what happens to the asymptotes if you have these types of transformations. A reflection across the x-axis, a vertical shift up 3, and a horizontal shift left 2. So let's talk about the vertical asymptote first. It was x equals 0, or the y-axis. If you have a horizontal shift left 2 units, that's going to move the vertical asymptote left 2 units. So now the vertical asymptote is going to be at x equals negative 2. The reflection about the x-axis will not have any effect on it, and a vertical shift up 3 will not have any effect. So now the vertical asymptote is at x equals negative 2, and so it's this dashed line for the graph of g of x. Now let's talk about the horizontal asymptote. The horizontal asymptote of y equals 1 over x is the x-axis, or y equals 0. Well, if you have a horizontal asymptote at y equals 0, which is the x-axis, let's do the reflection first. Well, if you have a reflection about the x-axis, the horizontal asymptote y equals 0 will have no effect, so it'll stay y equals 0. However, if you have a vertical shift up 3 units, the horizontal asymptote will sh also shift up 3 units. So the horizontal asymptote will now be at y equals 3 and a horizontal shift left 2 units will have no effect. So y equals 3 is now the horizontal asymptote for the graph of g of x. So we have a vertical asymptote at x equals negative 2, and a horizontal asymptote at y equals 3. And so again, notice that the graph will now be divided up into four different regions. The graph will be in the top left corner because we have a reflection about the x-axis, so it will pass through the point negative 3 comma 4. When it's increasing without bound, when you get closer to x equals negative 2 on the left side, and it'll get closer and closer to the horizontal asymptote y equals 3 as you go to the left. On the other hand, the graph will be in the bottom right corner formed from your vertical asymptote and your horizontal asymptote, and the graph will pass through the point negative 1 comma 2. It will be decreasing without bound as you get closer to x equals negative 2 from the right side, and eventually the graph will get closer and closer to y equals 3 as x approaches positive infinity for its end behavior. And so it looks like the range of this graph is it looks like you use all the y values from negative infinity to positive 3, but y equals 3 is not used because that's the horizontal asymptote. You get closer to y equals 3 but never actually get there. And then the graph continues going up for this part of the graph. So it'll be union 3 to infinity. So the range is negative infinity to 3, union 3 to infinity, all with parentheses. So this is a good place to stop our video. And then we talked about rational functions and their graphs. We talked about how to determine the domain of a rational function. We also describe the transformations used to graph a rational function from the basic rational function y equals 1 over x or y equals 1 over x squared. If you have any questions about any examples in this video, please let me know. Or if you have any questions while you work on the homework for this section, please let me know that as well. And I'll see you at the next video when we talk about how to find the vertical and horizontal asymptotes of a rational function.